All right, everybody, glad to see you today. Uh, if I've not met you yet, my name is Al, and I'm the lead pastor at Compassion Christian. I want to welcome you, uh, and I hope that already you've uh, felt as if the Lord is speaking to you and that this has been a time that has just been set aside for you because God is speaking directly to you. I, I just think especially today's selection uh, in, in our song service was just anointed. Wow, what a beautiful way to kind of lead us to the place where I want us to go today, uh, and more importantly, where God wants us to lead, uh, be led. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, uh, we want to welcome you to Compassion Christian. We hope that God is going to speak to you, that you're going to, to feel as if uh, this service has been planned especially for you. We hope that uh, our, our members and regular attenders have warmly welcomed you. They've said hello, at least. They've smiled at you. Uh, and also, we want you to do us a special favor as our way of saying thank you for um, for coming today. We have a gift for you. All we ask is that you take a few moments today after you're done and you go out to the lobby and, and at our connecting point desk, we're going to have a connect card. And that is just a way of us having a record of your attendance today. Uh, our members and our regular attenders are encouraged to use your connect card as a way to communicate to us. If you have a prayer request, um, if there's something going on that you want us to pray about, whether it's through our prayer team or confidentially, you can do that. But as our first time guest, we're asking you to go out to the Connecting Point lobby, fill that out and let us know about your time and leave it there. And we'll give you that gift as our way of saying thank you. Uh, so today I'm excited to, uh, to start uh, this, this sermon. Uh, I'm excited that we're in, I think, week number three of our series called Recalculating. Next weekend, we're going to close it out with a message about how to just discover God's will for your life. Maybe you're at the point where you're kind of wondering what God wants you to do, and we're going to be talking about that, ne that next weekend. Uh, but for today, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21. I'll meet you there in a few moments, and I'll also get out your message. So you can follow along today if that is your uh, desire. Uh, have you turn there? Uh, and I want to lead out today by telling you a story that I read from a pastor that I think really sets us up for where we're going today. Matt Woodley is a, a writer, a preacher, and uh, a Christian leader. And he told about a time a few summers ago when he was watching his 18-year-old son participate in a real X paintball tournament. How many of you have ever played paintball? How many of you brave souls have done that, right? And then if you haven't played, it's probably because you realize it's not fun to get hematomas all over your body uh, just in the name of, of fun. Well, anyway, in this tournament, Woodley told about the fact that uh, the, the, um, the paintball game is really kind of a high stakes, high energy, high testosterone type of situation where they have sophisticated paintball guns that shoot 13 balls per second. Now, I don't know if that's normal, but that's pretty fast and pretty rapid. And the concept is that you have five players on each team, and the, the goal is to eliminate or kill, which means hit by a paintball, eliminate the other team members uh, on the opposing squad, and so you can get the victory and capture their flag. But during the course of the game, one of the things that, that Woodley noticed is that uh, even though their coach was yelling out information about where their opponents were placed, so fans of the opposing squad are yelling out incorrect directions, like telling them and trying to fake them out as to where the opponents really were. They were yelling out false information. And so it struck Woodley by surprise, and he said, after I am listening to these fans and even our fans trying to confuse the opponents, I was really shocked about it. Like it was cheating. It seemed like it wasn't, it wasn't being very ca uh, kind or nice. But then after the match, Woodley says, my son calmly explained to me, Dad, that's part of the game. That's called counter coaching. That's just what you do. You have to learn to listen to the voice of your coach, and then you'll be a lot better off. You have to ignore all of the other voices and focus on that and block out all the other distractions. Well, friends, in the same way, the Bible clearly warns us that we need to listen to the right voice. And there are competing voices that are counter-coaching in your life and mine all the time. I mean, there, there's plenty of counter-coaching that's going on right now, maybe even in this room. Maybe today you are being influenced by your culture. Your culture is telling you one thing, and yet you feel like you should be doing another. Maybe the enemy, the devil, has been working really hard on you this week and is trying to give you directions, and he's counter-coaching you to go away from the will of God. Or could it be today that it's even your voice 
that you're fighting against, realizing that maybe you are the one who's wanting to take a turn and and make a decision that is not within the will of God. So what happens when you find yourself in that spot, when, when you realize you've listened to the wrong voice and that voice was yours? And you are the one who, who, is, who is responsible for where you are right now. How do you respond when the person responsible for the wrong decision in your life is you? What do you do about that? Well, this can apply to any small aspect of your life, but I w- want you to really think about the major areas of your life and mine. Think in terms of the choices that you've made in life that didn't turn out very well, that, that you realize now were not within the will of God. These are decisions that have yielded your greatest failures in life. Maybe you turned uh, toward a career path through the, through the pressure of people that you love because it, it, it was going to give you you, it was going to give you more money, but it really has not brought you any peace. Like you've been guided toward a career path where the people that, that, that you listened to said, oh, you need to make this, this much money, and yet you realize it doesn't give you the time or the balance in your life, and now your job is the number one stress point in your life. And you're thinking, how did I ever end this way? And so maybe, uh, that's, maybe if that's not you, maybe you had a sense years ago that God was, was guiding you toward, uh, guiding you away from a particular relationship or an association with, with a person or persons that have now dragged you down, but you ignored those promptings and you went head first into it, and now the situation is toxic. For others of you, maybe that's not you. Maybe you're regretting the fact that, that you decided to tell a lie, just one little small lie. And then before long, you had to tell another lie to cover up the first lie. And then as the lies pile on, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And you've spawned this web of deception and you don't know how to get out of it. Or maybe that's not you. Maybe today your your mess up and your failure is financial. Like you made a decision uh, years ago that reflected pride and greed. Like it was about more money and it was about the prestige that would come with with that financial decision. And now you find yourself at the place where you are no longer able to be generous toward the work of God. And it's led you off of the path. You know, I love love what C.S. Lewis said about this. It's a quote that I found that was new that I've never used on you before. He said, there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done And those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. And God often leaves us in that. So maybe today you find yourself in the latter part of that, where where God has let you have your own way, and it's not turned out very well. Things have not gone very well. So it doesn't feel good to realize that, that we're responsible for the mess that we find ourselves in. Because there are times when we have diverted from the plans that God had for us simply because of our pride or because of our ego or because we were disobedient to his word or we just decided, you know what, I'm going to try it my own way and see what happens. When we come to that realization, it's humbling and it's alarming and it's even annoying, isn't it? To, to realize, you know what, I have really royally messed this up. So however you want to describe it, I think everybody in this room knows what it is like to fail to follow God's will at times. Like you know what it's like to fail to follow God's will. And even the word failure is, is full of negative connotations. Like you associate other words with failure like, um, uh, like inferior or inadequate or disappointment. And that's how we view fear. And so what we try to do is we try to avoid failure at all costs in every area of our lives. But what if, what if when it comes to failure, we've been looking at it the wrong way? What if uh, when viewed from the right perspective that failure is actually a positive thing and it can be a positive thing? What if I told you that it is a necessary element of following God's will for your life? Would you believe me? If I told you that. So the truth is that failure is one of the primary building blocks of every time you've been successful in following God's plan for your life. Now, I didn't, I didn't speak incorrectly. Let me say it again. The truth is that failure is one of the primary building blocks of every time you've been successful in following God's plan for your life. Now, just think back over the course of your life. You don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell down quite a bit. 
Now, you might have seen it on video if your parents showed it and preserved it, but every time you got back up from falling, you got stronger and more confident, and eventually you became a proficient walker. Maybe it's, uh, if you think about playing a sport, maybe the first time you ever tried to swing a golf club, you were probably really bad at it and a danger to everybody on the course. But the more you practiced, the more you put into your craft, your competency increased. Or maybe for some of you, it's learning how to drive. When you learned how to drive, you didn't immediately go into parallel parking, did you? You know, parallel parking is not a a skill that comes easily. You have to learn and practice. You've got to fail a few times, hopefully not hit any cars, but you've got to learn how to fail. You've got to learn how to get over that. So life is this process of going through a series of failures, missteps that shape your ability to succeed. The key is to have the right perspective on the times that you fail to be in the will of God. You see, don't see failure as a dead end because it will destroy you. Instead, see your failure as a stepping stone that that is going to take you to a better place and it's going to lead you to greater things. So when you make a wrong turn and you get off the path of God's will for your life, you have a choice to make. And that choice is that you can either use failure as an excuse to give up or you can let your failure grow you up. When you are out of the will of God and you mess up, you can say, you know what, I'm going to give up. I can't figure out what God wants. Or you can say, I am going to let it grow me up. So in this series that we've been talking about, we want to, we want to deal today with how we manage when wrong, wrong turns are taken in our lives and how we deal with the failure that comes from that. And so I want to show you how God uses that experience to grow us. And as long as we're humble enough to make the needed changes, we're going to be okay. So I've asked you to turn to John 21. We're going to examine the life of Jesus' disciple named Peter. And when Jesus was starting his earthly ministry and he called Peter to follow him, Peter is busy running his family's fishing business. And so around Jesus, this impulsive fisherman understood, you know what, there's something different about Jesus. So I'm going to leave my career behind and I'm going to join with him and the rest of his followers. Peter quickly became one of the inner circle that followed and surrounded Jesus. Years later, Jesus went so far as to use Peter to preach a powerful message that launched the early church, and 3,000 people were added to the church on one single day because of the Holy Spirit's power coming through him. Well, one night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus is with his apostles. They're all having dinner together. And as they were talking about what was to come, Jesus said something that was a bombshell. He said to them that one person around the table was going to betray him. Now, this was unsettling and upsetting, and all of the people were like, no, no, it's not me. We, we know later it was Judas he was referring to, but for some reason, Simon Peter decided, you know what, i got to make sure Jesus knows it's not me, so I, I'll paraphrase what he said. He basically said, you know what, if everybody else falls away, all these other losers leave you, God, I, I'm not going to be the one to do that. I am like least likely to betray you. It, it's not going to be, you, you know that, right, Jesus? And paraphrasing again, Jesus said, Peter, be careful what you say, because when I need you the most, you're actually going to let me down. When I need you the most, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, Peter did not believe that, but Jesus made this prediction. And so uh, fast forward then to the night that Jesus was arrested. The Jewish officials arrest Christ. All of his disciples are terrified. And the reason they're afraid is that the arrest of Jesus meant that pretty soon they were next. Pretty soon that they were going to be lumped in that category and they might be arrested and and tried as well. And so not only was Jesus their leader, they imagined that they they were going to be next in line. So they all scattered except for Peter. The Bible tells us that he stayed close to where Jesus was being held because he wanted to see what was happening. And in John's account of that night, he actually writes that Peter was warming himself by a fire nearby uh, Jesus' holding place. And a young girl looked across the flicker of the flames and said, Hey, wait a minute. I know you. You are one of those guys with Jesus. And that began the first of his three denials. So Peter did exactly what he said he would never do. He did exactly what Jesus predicted he would do. And so this was was so upsetting and shattering and crushing to him, he left and rejoined the family business of fishing. 
Now, so this, what we're going to pick up today is days after the resurrection, um, and Peter has this encounter with Jesus that I want to look at, as it's going to help you see how our decisions to divert from God's will is neither fatal nor final as long as we're alive. So look at John chapter 21 in uh, verses 1 through 19. Here's what it says. Afterward, Jesus again appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, being John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. In other words, that's Jesus talking to us from the bank. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, listen to what he does. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. He jumps in. The other disciples followed in the boat, uh, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. So that's still a pretty good, 100 yards to swim is a pretty long way. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None uh, None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now, how many times had Peter denied Jesus? Three. How many times did Jesus reinstate Simon Peter? Three. You see the symbolism. You see why he did it to get him to see, you know what? You are completely and utterly forgiven and restored. I want you to know that. And the reason that it had gone to that place is that Jesus gives him this command. You know the first thing that Jesus said when he would call a follower? He would say, follow me. He didn't say, start coming to church, learn religion, be a better person. He would say, follow me. That's what he said to every single person. That's what he says to everybody in this room, regardless of whether or not you've taken up that charge. He says, follow me. And he said that even when Simon Peter had the greatest failure of his life. He said, again, follow me. Nothing's changed. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Walk back with me. It's okay. You've gone through a failure, but it's still the same call to follow me. And so what I want you to see this morning is that Simon Peter found his greatest success in life after his life-defining failure. That's what happened in his life. Peter went on to become one of the most celebrated leaders of the church. He started and he was a catalyst in the beginning of the the greatest missionary movement that the world has ever seen to turn the world upside down. All all that because he, he he did not let his failure keep him from being used by God. 
Friends, I believe that if we will follow his example, I think there are four keys in the story to walking through your greatest failures in life when you're out of God's will. And I believe that if you and I will approach our own failures this way, our failures will truly grow us up and will not cause us to give up. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do is to embrace the emotion that failure brings. I mean, Whenever you mess up, whenever you sin, whenever you've hurt someone, you should have the, the appropriate amount of emotion tied with that. You should be sad, you should be disappointed, you should be angry with yourself, you should be hurt, all of those things. And, and so nobody likes to come up short in life. Nobody does. And, and what we see in, in the story is that Jesus, uh, uh, rather Peter had failed Jesus three times, and he had this overwhelming emotional to his failures. The Bible says that he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now the Bible is, is not really much for exaggeration and all of that. When the Bible adds that it, it could have just left it that he wept, okay, he was a little upset, he was embarrassed. No, it says that he wept bitterly because he had this tremendous emotional reaction. The weight of what he had done was resting on his shoulders. And so what I want you to see today is that you should embrace the emotions of what, uh, of what you feel when you go through your failures. Now you, can, you and I can relate to this. When you and I recognize that we failed at something, and so think about what it is that, that your greatest failure is. Think about the, the time that you just got out of God's will, whether it, whether it was with your job or a relationship, or a personal goal that you realize, you know, this is not God's will for me, or in overcoming an addiction. Think about the times that you messed up on that. We face a barrage of emotions that make us want to give up altogether. And you know, the problem is, is that oftentimes we make very important decisions when we're at the highest of highs in our emotions, or at the lowest of the lows. And that's a mistake. We embrace the emotions, but we don't live in that and, and allow our emotions to dictate what we're going to do. So what Peter did in the, in the lowest of his emotions is that he went into hiding. He ran. He went out. We may want to drop out. And, and I think, you know, probably the people that really need to be here today might be those who have said, you know what, I've sinned. I'm out of God's will, so I'm just going to stay out of church. Because after all, church is only for everybody who's got it all figured out, right? 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 I mean, the, the person next to you has probably got everything in life figured out. That's the reason they're here, right? They just want to glory in, in what they've got, right? No, we know that, that allowing our, ourselves to make a decision to say, you know what, I'm a failure. I don't need to be there. That's the worst decision you could ever make. You know, that's why in general it's said that men, uh, when they get out of God's will or they, or they fail, men have a difficult time dealing with career failures because often it's our career that seems to define us. You know, one of the second questions you ask somebody is, besides what's your name, is what do you do for a living? And that's what we think defines us. So if you have a failure in your career, we think, well, that's, that's a failure of, of who I am. And they say that women actually have, uh, have a, a deeper emotional reaction to relational failures because they are, uh, by nature, more emotional in their relationships and see that as a very important part of who they are. And so whenever you fail, it's really going to depend on your emotional makeup and your personality and, and the things that you hold dear. But here's what I want you to know. When you find yourself in that place where you've gone off the rails and you know that you're out of God's will for your life, don't be surprised by the intensity of the emotions that you feel. Most importantly, don't ignore them. Don't try to stuff them down and suppress them. Say, you know what? I'm going to acknowledge that I'm afraid. I'm going to, going to acknowledge that I'm angry. I'm going to acknowledge that I want to blame somebody else. I'm going to acknowledge that I, that I have shame. Like it's flooding me and I, I wish I had never made that decision. Work through those things instead of allowing them to keep you away from God. Now there are two practical ways you can do that. There are two practical ways you embrace your emotion. The first one is that you need to surround yourself with strong, godly positive people. Surround yourself with good friends who will be there to give you the proper amount of sympathy and compassion and empathy, but also won't let you stay where you are. They'll say, you know what? It's time to move. It's time to get up. It's time to stop mourning. It's time to stop beating yourself up because you're forgiven in Christ. The second thing you need to do is talk to Jesus about your failure. Talk to the Lord about your failure. And, and you know, I, I think that, that even if you're, you don't feel like you're very close to God, talk to Him anyway about your failure. Be brutally honest about how you feel. Admit that you're disappointed. Admit that you're 
hurt. Admit that you're frustrated, and he's going to help you get back up and get headed in the right direction. That's why the Hebrew writer says, a, uh, says something about Jesus that, that I want to remind you of today. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable, unable to, simp- to empathize rather, with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You have a high priest in Jesus who sympathizes with you and says, you know what, I I, I can understand what you're feeling, but don't stay away from me. The second step, the second key in the story that we see from Simon Peter is that you need to draw closer to God, and this is going to go against every when you fail, you see this as a separation between you and God. And the Bible is clear that sin separates us from God. But you know what brings us back to God? His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. So you may think that your failure makes you this grand disappointment in God's eyes, but God is waiting for you to come back home, wanting to draw you closer through your failure. But when we go through difficulty caused by our own decisions, most of us want to stay away from God. We don't want to pray anymore. We don't want to be in life group anymore. We don't want to be around other people who might encourage us. Now, going back to Peter's story, I want you to to notice how he initially responded. You might notice that he withdrew, he went back to the fishing thing, he allowed his failure to push him away. And, and I think, I wonder, even in that group, if he's, he's there and all of the other apostles are around him, and you know, maybe he didn't even want to be with them in that moment. So he said, you know what, I'm going fishing. So maybe he was thinking, now this is just my opinion, this is not scriptural, uh, not scriptural necessarily, it's my opinion of scripture. Maybe he was like, you know what, I want to, want to be by myself, but they were like, no, we'll go with you. Why? Because they were going to be there with him to make sure that he had somebody to to process this with. He wanted to isolate himself, but they were not going to let him. And so he returned to his life as a fisherman. Maybe he was thinking, you know what? God can never use me. I'm too much of a I'm too much of a, a mess up. I, you know, I just mess up everything I get my hands on. God doesn't have a plan for my life. But in an effort to use uh, Peter's failure for good, I love the fact that it was the Lord who sought him out. He's out there exactly where Jesus thought he would be, and Jesus is on the shore, and he's seeking him out. And when Peter realized that Jesus had not given up on him, the Bible says he swam back to the relationship, a hundred yards back to the shore and was restored. And so God wants us to, to use everything we go through in life as a way to draw closer to him, but the choice is yours to make. So I wonder this morning, what failure in your life is currently stopping you from drawing close to God? What relationship has ended? Is your marriage on the rocks? Is your career not going the way you want it to go? Is your struggle with a recurring sin that you cannot leave behind and it makes you feel like you don't deserve God's forgiveness and His mercy? You see, if you're letting your faith, uh, your failure rather, push you away from God, you're making the wrong choice. What I would encourage you to do is follow the example of Simon Peter. Get out of the boat and swim as fast as you can toward Jesus. Go back. Go back to Him and be restored. The third thing, the third key, is you need to get to the root of your failure. You need to get to the root of it. If you don't learn from your failure, you're wasting an opportunity. One of the first steps when you fail should be to identify the root of the problem. Now, among the things that that we could identify for Simon Peter, for example, would be his pride. It was his pride that led him to stand up and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Everybody else may deny you, not me. Everybody else may fall away, but I'm going to be there in the end, Lord. It was his pride in thinking that he would be the only one that would never do that. And yet, his pride led to his greatest downfall, but it was in his greatest downfall that he discovered humility, the humility that he needed. So once you figure out what caused your failure, and nobody is better at that than you at figuring that out, take whatever insight you learn from that and learn from that, and every failure is a part of your growth in Jesus. Think of failure as a test And when you identify the cause of it and you learn from it, you pass the test. 
And when you pass the test, you're stronger, wiser, and more prepared in the future to embrace God's forgiveness and step into His plan for your life. After all, we know that God does that in a, a miraculous way. Romans 8, 28, we read it last week. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So friends, if it was your pride that caused you to go your own way years ago, don't stay there. If it was your lust that drove you to participate in activities that are now blurring the face of God and deafening His voice in your life, don't allow that to stay the same. If it's your anger that caused you to begin a pattern of abuse and control over the people that you love, it's time to repent. It's time to give it back to God. It's time to identify the root of your issue and repent of it. Turn it back over to God. So, just so we don't forget, in, in way of review, the first three keys, you embrace the emotion that your failure brings. Number two, you draw closer to God, not away from Him. Number three, you get to the root of your failure and you work through. And then finally, you find and obey the new plan. Now, oftentimes God's universal will has, has not changed for you. And in fact, it never changes. God wants all to be saved and all to come to repentance. But sometimes God's specific will for your life may change because of a decision that you made and things can't go back to the way they were. And God may have a new plan for your life. The late Zig Ziglar once said, failure is a detour, not a dead end. If with God, that is very, very true. When you give your failure over to God, He's going to exchange it for a new plan. He's going to replace your negative emotions with strength and faith. And when God is involved, there is no failure that's ever final. Not a single one. So get back up. Tell God what you want Him to handle. Tell God what you want Him to take away. And invest in His new plan for your life. Failure should never prevent you from reaching your God-given potential. It should be a building block to, to help you get there. Now, you may or may not know how Peter's story ended. It doesn't end in Acts chapter 2. It doesn't end with him writing his letters. Actually, Peter's story ended when Christianity spread into the Roman Empire. Uh, as Christianity began to spread and the Roman Empire grew, Christianity actually became an enemy religion. And as more of the Caesars got into power, people like Nero would burn people at the stake for becoming Christians. And the Bible says that uh, thousands, I, I'm sorry, uh, the history books tell us that thousands were crucified because of their faith in Jesus. And ultimately, history tells us, and the Bible alluded to it, that Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus said about Peter, the kind of death he was going to die, Peter, when he was older and could not see very well, he was arrested and identified as a Christian leader. And he was told that if he would just bow his knee to Caesar and deny Jesus, then he would live. So ironically, he finds himself at the same spot he was when he's around that fire, and he has a choice. If I just deny Jesus now, I can live out my days in peace. I can just go on about my business. I can live a few more years. After all, life is you know what it's all about. But instead, he said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to deny this again. I'm not going to allow my greatest failure to be a repetitive thing in my life. He was crucified, but you know what? He chose to be crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die as my Lord did. He said, I'm going to seize this opportunity. I'm going to learn from my failure. Now, friends, you and I in this room may never die for our faith in that way, but we are called to take up our cross daily. We are called all to, to, on a daily basis, surrender our will to the will of God. Because if we don't, as C.S. Lewis said, God's going to say, okay, have it your way. Do what you want to do, and pretty soon those consequences will run out. And you'll see that God's will is the best. So when you embrace the positive implications that failure can have and commit to seeking God in the midst of your pain and your disappointment, God's going to give you unshakable faith and strength to face whatever the future holds. And I believe that that can happen for someone here today. Let's pray together. Father, we know that the, the stories that are told of the people who had faith in you, they're not just there, Lord, to set a high standard that we can never reach. Lord, we know that it is your grace that allows us to go to, to higher highs and to avoid the lowest lows. 
Lord, we know that it is your mercy that gives us the ability to, to begin again. And God, I pray that today we would not get stuck in our failures. We would not get stuck where we are, Lord, and out of your will. We would not simply throw up our hands and say it's useless, it's pointless. That we would listen, God, and draw back close to you again. That we would listen to your new plan for us, Lord, and lean into it. Father, thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the leading of Scripture and for the advice and counsel of other people. God, I pray that we would listen. Help us, Lord, in this in our moment of need, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to offer an invitation for a couple of people. I want to offer an invitation.